I wanted to find out the truth about Canada's carbon tax. It will no longer be free to pollute anywhere in Canada. Canadians are set to see another hike to the federal carbon tax next month. Axe the tax! Axe the tax! So of course, the first thing I did was go to Elon Musk Presents X, please don't call it Twitter.com, where I found some people are living paycheck to paycheck. The carbon tax is literally killing them. Guess we paid enough carbon tax here in Alberta. It's minus 40 degrees Celsius. Liberal math. A tax can't change the weather. I'm not sacrificing anything anything until all the elites who say they support this sacrifice their lavish lifestyles, excessive housing, and mass use of fossil fuels. You are the carbon they want to reduce. Turns out almost half of all Canadians want to abolish their carbon tax versus a scant 15% who want it to continue as planned. Overwhelmingly, the carbon tax is an idea that economists love and voters hate. We're currently in the middle of an affordability crisis. So as this tax is set to increase on, and I wish I was making this up, April Fool's Day every year from now until 2030, it makes sense to ask, is this a communications problem as the prime minister's office and your own ears have just concluded? Or is there something more going on here? This is usually when supporters of the carbon tax scream, but you get a rebate, which is true. But if your policy involves handing people a wad of cash four times a year and they're still pissed at you, something has gone horribly, horribly wrong. Welcome to The Goose Explains. You may not know this, but Canada is actually a super secret petro state. We're actually one of the biggest producers of oil and gas in the world. At the same time, we're also in a climate crisis that's just become so painfully obvious. Even oil and gas companies are spending millions of dollars to look like they actually give a shit. Canadians believe we need to reduce emissions. We agree. That's why we're proposing to build one of the world's largest carbon capture and storage networks. See our plan at pathwaysalliance. So given our outsized contribution to this little existential threat called anthropogenic global warming, let's take an in-depth look at our government's keystone climate policy, the carbon tax, and try to figure out why so many people seem to hate it. To really understand the carbon tax, we need to learn a little bit of the enigmatic language of the elites, economics. For instance, if you're in Davos and you hear someone say, aviation creates a negative externality not reflected in the price of jet fuel, that means flying my private jet is destroying the planet. And maybe that would be okay if I just had to pay a little more for it. The key word here is externality. Basically, an externality is some outcome from a transaction that affects someone else who is not part of that transaction. To take an easy example, let's say I sell you a car stereo for 20 bucks, but it turns out I got it by just smashing in some guy's car window, costing them $500. Normal people would call this a crime, but economists would say that extra $500 is actually an externality. Externalities can range from positive to negative. For instance, a positive externality could be planting some native plants to help local pollinator populations, or high quality education creating innovation, or organic waste in cities creating a superior race of hyper-intelligent raccoons to rule over us with an iron paw. But human-made carbon emissions from burning fossil fuels trapping the equivalent of 800,000 Hiroshima atomic bombs in additional heat energy per day in the atmosphere is decidedly a negative externality. And if you're thinking that number seems absurdly high, don't worry, that number is also true. So how do you get less of an externality you don't like? Economic theory suggests raising the price. Going back to our example, in a perfect market, you would have to pay both the sale price and the externality cost, meaning $520 for a car stereo I clearly just ripped out of a 1998 Honda Civic. And since no one in their right mind would pay that, my otherwise genius business model collapses. And as a consequence, car break-ins go down. So if excess carbon is bad, why not put a price on that carbon, buddy? And if you're a government, you can do that very easily by imposing a tax. Supporters will tell you that taxing carbon is the lowest cost, most efficient way to reduce emissions because the market's invisible hand will decrease demand for fossil fuels while simultaneously incentivizing energy efficiency and low carbon energy sources like wind, solar, nuclear, hydro, or just hooking up your Peloton bike that you're definitely still using up to the grid. In short, if you believe in the power of the market, 
Carbon pricing is a market-based solution for market failure to reflect the cost of global warming's figurative and literal broken car windows. Despite many on the right today seeing the carbon tax as a policy endorsed exclusively by woke elites, soy boys, betas, and cucks, it may surprise you to learn that for decades, it was the sole domain of conservative policy circles. Here is perhaps the world's most influential libertarian giga-chat economist, Milton Friedman, explaining why taxing pollution is good, actually. You're not going to condemn uh, regulations uh, regarding emission and... Uh, I certainly am. Of course I'm going to condemn them. Why not? Because if we don't have them, you're, going, you're not going to be able to breathe, and you and I will not be in our senior years able to sit around and argue with each other. There is a case for doing something about pollution, but the way we've been going about it is the wrong way. Is there a case for the government to do something yes, about it? Yes, there is a case for the government to do something about it, because there's always a case for the government, to some extent, when what two people do affects a third party. There's no case for the government whatsoever in mandating airbags. Okay, editors note, Milton Friedman just goes on this weird rant about how airbags are impinging on your freedom, so I'm just cutting that. But there is a case for the government protecting third parties, protecting people who have not voluntarily agreed to enter. So there's more of a case, for example, for uh, emission control than there is for airbags. Mm -hmm. But the question is, what's the best way to do it? The best way to do it is to impose a tax on the amount of pollu po pollutants emitted by a car and make it in the self-interest of, of the car manufacturers and of the consumers to keep down the amount of pollution in that way. That's right. Long before climate change ominously sat in the back of your mind like a hungry ghost threatening to eat the future, trickle-down Reaganomics had the solution to pollution bypass the incompetent bureaucrats who want to regulate you to death. Instead, tax pollution and the all-knowing wisdom of the market will decide whether or not your child should be able to breathe air without getting lead poisoning. To be fair, market-based solutions to environmental problems have worked in the past. If you're young, like me, You probably don't remember how trees used to die in large swaths when acid literally poured from the sky. But we solved acid rain in Canada and the United States in the early 90s with the ugly stepsister of a pollution tax, cap and trade. A concept that would take too long to explain, but essentially we put a limit on pollution that slowly got lower by making coal executives wear funny hats that they traded around in a circle until they promised to stop turning God's tears into sulfuric acid with their smokestacks. You may be asking, isn't it simpler to just pass a law to get the same result? Sure. 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 But I think we could all agree that that would be an unreasonable and unacceptable violation of coal plant freedom. Instant regret. Uh, why did I throw these? So if pollution pricing was so popular in the 90s, why didn't we just put a price on carbon back then? Well, actually, we almost did. But luckily, this brave oil company put a stop to it. First, a little Canadian history. Back in the late 80s, the Canadian government under Prime Minister Brian Mulroney, rest in peace, introduced the Goods and Services Tax, or GST. Today, the GST is a 5% tax on everything, except for a few essentials. Economists supported this move because it replaced a tax on manufacturers, which the public didn't see. The new GST would keep revenues the same, but incentivized more manufacturing, and thus more jobs and more productivity. The problem was, voters hated this new tax on everything, and by extension, the prime minister who gave it to them. 18 months ago, they threatened to tax my haircuts. And that was my, that was it. That was the thing that set me off. Albertan seem incensed by the proposed GST. Earlier this week, more than 1,500 showed up at a protest rally called Axe the Tax. Mulroney became about as popular as The Play. Is any of this starting to sound familiar to you yet? To get out of the mess he created, he did what men have been doing for thousands of years. He left it for a woman to clean up. For 15 minutes, Kim Campbell was Canada's prime minister. Feminism. Only for her to be crushed in the next election by Jean Chrétien, a guy who went on to literally choke a dude on live TV with basically no consequences. While all that domestic drama was playing out, Canada made significant international climate commitments at the Rio Earth Summit in 1992. And by then there were rumblings within the legislature about replacing the GST, a tax which voters hated, with, you guessed it, a carbon tax. Instead of paying a tax on everything, you'd only pay more for carbon-intensive products. 
a win for the planet, international cooperation, balanced budgets, and democracy, right? Right? Hearing about this from one of their flying monkey messengers, Imperial Oil, the Canadian arm of what is now ExxonMobil, commissioned a study to see how this would affect their bottom line. Exxon's leaked internal documents from 1993 projected that Canada replacing the GST with a carbon tax could stabilize emissions over a number of years without significantly affecting economic growth. But unfortunately for Exxon, it might result in a 12% reduction in downstream revenue. And I know what you're thinking. Oh no, not a 12% reduction in downstream revenue. In response, Imperial Oil implemented an aggressive PR and lobbying campaign to strangle the carbon tax in the cradle. Despite their own findings to the contrary, they played up economic uncertainty and cast doubt on the effectiveness of the policy. And it worked. Put another way, if not for this foreign company straight up lying and manipulating our democracy, Canada might have replaced our current tax on everything with a tax on carbon. And we'd be in a much better position to manage our current problems. And that's not my opinion. That's according to Exxon. Anyway, for more on this, check out The Petroleum Papers by Jeff Dembicki. It wouldn't be until 2007 when carbon pricing was finally introduced in Canada, in the province of, wait a minute, Alberta? That's right, one year after an inconvenient truth, the strong and free Albertans under the government of Ed Stelmack imposed a $15 a ton carbon price with the Specified Gas Emitters Regulation, or SDRV for short. That was later to be updated to their tier system. And if all of this is news to you, that's because it only affects large industrial emitters, even if it still falls short of the current federally mandated standard. For the record, Quebec also brought in their carbon pricing system in 2007, but like you expect that from Quebec. The table was now set for a bold national carbon tax. And in 2008, liberal leader Stéphane Zion ran on very seriously a carbon tax and brutally lost. Flash forward to 2017, two years after our Stephen Harper era, and the Conservative Party of Canada needed a new leader. So Michael Chong ran on a bold plan to implement a carbon tax and brutally lost. Now, after close to 10 years of Justin Trudeau as prime minister and about five-ish years of his very seriously a carbon tax, he appears to be headed towards this same graveyard of political careers. So now that us tree-hugging Canadians have our beloved carbon tax, let's talk about how it actually works. First, it sets a minimum floor, leaving room for provincial carbon pricing systems. That's why Quebec and British Columbia don't receive a carbon tax rebate. They have their own carbon pricing. For all these other provinces that fall under the federal carbon pricing system, as of April 2024, the carbon tax is set at $80 per ton of CO2. Roughly translated, that's around 17 cents per liter of gasoline and around 15 cents per cubic meter of natural gas. To put that into perspective, a full tank of an evil but warm Ford Bronco SUV is 78 liters. Filling it halfway is about $6.63 in carbon tax. The per ton price rises $15 a year until 2030, when the federal carbon price will be set at $170 per ton, roughly doubling what it is now. Why $170? This comes back to externalities. Basically, economists tried to calculate the social cost of carbon, adding up all the damage that one ton of carbon dioxide causes to human health, to the planet, to the economy. And then they were like, Oh God, it's $294, that's way too high. And then they like cut it in half. So if anything, $170 is a steep discount. Remember, more expensive fossil energy is a feature, not a bug of the carbon tax. But because energy is the lifeblood of the economy, raising the cost of fossil energy too quickly, especially when other countries like China and the United States continue to free ride, has political and economic consequences. It's frankly why we need something like a fossil fuel non-proliferation treaty instead of a free for all where we all try to extract the shit out of the planet the fastest and collectively destabilize the physical and biological systems that make organized human life possible. But I digress. That said, it's hard to sell people on the idea of taxing carbon when the cost of driving to work, heating your home, cooking your food, etc., suddenly goes up. And by suddenly, I mean announced several years in advance. In any case, how are people supposed to accept this increase? Well, what if you pool that money and give it back as a rebate? This is known as a revenue neutral carbon fee and dividend approach. And it's what the federal carbon tax is designed to do. 
And when they say revenue neutral, that means the money goes back to the taxpayers and the province they live in. Rebates vary depending on where you live. Rural communities get more than cities and the size of your family. More kids, more money. There are lots of online calculators to see exactly how much you get and I'll leave a link in the description for you. But of course, as the tax increases, so does the rebate. So yes, technically I shouldn't be calling this a carbon tax because it's properly a revenue neutral carbon fee and dividend. That said, I'm just gonna keep calling it a carbon tax because with all of the time I save by not constantly repeating revenue neutral carbon fee and dividend, I get to tell you a neat fact about who actually first proposed the idea. This engineering professor from MIT who invented the recumbent bicycle, AKA the bike Squidward rides. Carbon tax, neat fact. Which brings us to where elegant economic theory meets the messy real world of money and politics. Economic models typically assume human beings are perfectly rational. But if you've been keeping an eye on the housing market, AKA Canadian Bitcoin, you already know that humans are deeply irrational. Back in 2019, when the government first started rolling out the carbon tax rebates, you didn't get your money directly. Instead, that money was given as a tax credit. Meaning when you filed your income taxes, your Canadian Climate Action Incentive would be lumped in with your entire tax refund or subtracted against what you owed. This cut down on administrative costs, but unless you're a weird nerd like me, you probably didn't even know you were receiving a Climate Action Incentive to begin with. Great job team. Keep up the good work. Realizing incentives only work if you know you're getting them, the government switched to direct deposits. But now vague wording from the banks, including Deposit Canada, Canada Fed, and DN Canada Fed Fed, make it difficult for people to identify what this money really is. Polling suggests that one week after the last carbon tax rebate went out, 51% of Canadians didn't think they got a rebate, which they almost certainly did. And that's kind of a problem. This is why anyone seriously looking at this issue has concluded, like my friend Hazel Thayer suggests, the best way to distribute the carbon tax rebate is through Money Gun. Ah! Ha -ha! Ha -ha! Uh, come on, buddy. Wow. Make it rain. Five minutes of cleanup later. Is through Money Gun. Oh, this is, yeah. 15 minutes of cleanup later. On top of this, a little over half of Canadians believe they pay more carbon tax than they receive in the rebate, which is yet another problem considering the government keeps saying 80% of people make more from the rebate than they pay in the tax. The policy is designed so that the top 20% with their higher carbon lifestyles like bigger houses, more cars, more flights, pay more while everyone else statistically is supposed to be better off than without the tax. It's effectively a carbon wealth transfer. So I get why rich f**ks like W. Brett Wilson, the former oil financier who left Canadian taxpayers to clean up his abandoned wells turned minority owner of a hockey team named after his haircut absolutely hates the carbon tax. But given the numbers, you would think more people would be happy to take money straight from the pocket of Dragon's Den's certified cast member. Because according to the nonpartisan Parliamentary Budget Officer or PBO, roughly 80% receive more than they pay in most provinces. Now I have to tell you that there are two major asterisks on that figure, which I'll get to in a moment. But for now, there's an element of human psychology at play here in the perception of the fairness of the tax. This study from Nature looked at how people perceive the value of their carbon tax refunds in Canada. Surprisingly, they found Canadians who learned the true value of their carbon tax rebates were significantly more likely to perceive themselves as net losers, even though most Canadians are net beneficiaries. In other words, evidence of the benefits made people more likely to believe they're getting screwed, not less. The study's authors explore several reasons for why this may happen. And the best explanation seems to be exposure to negative ads about the carbon tax and partisan affiliation. As respondents who report having voted for the conservative party were more likely to underestimate their rebates even when exposed to information about their true rebate amount in our survey experiment. So if we're at the point where doing the carbon tax math makes more people pissed off, 
even though they're probably making money from the rebates, you have to wonder, how does anyone have a hope in hell of selling this idea to the public? It's not like this policy is exactly intuitive. If it were, I wouldn't have to spend like 100 hours of my life making this video for you. Now for the first asterisk I mentioned. Remember, with just the carbon tax, the PPO says about 80% of Canadians receive more from the carbon tax rebate than they pay, and it's revenue neutral. But if you go to Pierre Polyev's Axe the Tax website, you'll find statements like, Parliamentary Budget Officer Report proves that the carbon tax will cost most households more than they ever get back. And weirdly, that's also true. That's because the PBO's economists chose to model a counterfactual world in which no climate policy was implemented at all and then extend that out until 2030. Whatever the difference their computer models showed was called economic impact, which personally feels unrealistic considering doing nothing about an existential threat isn't exactly the best basis of comparison. That's a little like getting stabbed and the doctor telling you that recovering from the surgery will mean you probably won't be able to work so you'll lose money. Of course it will, but none of that will mean anything if I fing bleed to death. I'm sounding like too much like John Oliver when I do that. Of course it will. <laughs> of course it will, but none of that fing matters if I fing bleed to death. But wait, isn't the carbon tax raising the cost of everything? Technically, yes. According to the Bank of Canada governor, the tax is responsible for about 0.15% of the inflation we've seen. But frankly, that's well below the other causes of inflation like oil and gas price shocks, a real estate squeeze, and of course, Galen f***ing Weston. He may have stepped down as CEO of Loblaws, but deep down, we all know this billionaire business twerp is secretly sneaking into grocery stores at night with a price gun like a greedy little grocery gnome to give us bangers like these. $20 for sliced cheese. $6 for a single roll of paper towel. $10 for some sad orange slices in a plastic tub. Are you serious? Are you sure you wouldn't rather my left kidney instead? The second asterisk has to do with our old friend GST. The original ax the tax tax. Turns out you actually pay GST on the carbon tax. Now you may be wondering, why are we adding a 5% tax onto what is already a tax? It's the goods and services tax, not goods, services, and taxes tax. And to that I say, good question. I tried to answer that for you, and the only answer that wasn't, it's all a liberal tax grab, seems to be that it's hard not to collect GST given how prices are all lumped together on your bill. But then I found this residential gas bill online from Manitoba, which seems to take the extra step of highlighting the federal GST on the carbon tax. So at least in this instance, it's not that hard. The stupidest part about this whole thing is that it completely contradicts the claim that the tax is revenue neutral for a mere 5% on a few cents of gas. It's like every day, the Trudeau government wakes up, loads a gun with one bullet, and then fires it into their foot, and then wonders why they're limping in the polls. How revenue non-neutral is the GST on the carbon tax? The parliamentary budget officer expects the federal government to take in a little less than $500 million in additional GST revenues from the carbon tax, or about eight Arrive Can apps. And that's not even the only sales tax collected on the carbon tax. Depending on where you live, there's probably a provincial sales tax, PST, or harmonized sales tax, HST, on top of that, which can be even higher than the GST. As a quick example, the Ontario government received more than $140 million in HST from taxing the carbon tax in 2019 alone, and that number has risen every year ever since. But despite loud and super nuanced opposition to the carbon tax... Guys, wake up, smell the coffee. Like, what don't you understand? cancel this carbon tax, put it on hold, do whatever. Premier Doug Ford appears happy to take that money while the feds take the political heat. But personally saying, but GST is not an argument to get rid of the carbon tax. It's more like an argument to find ways to exempt sales tax, give sales tax revenues back as part of the rebate, or who knows, maybe be a little more like Alberta and abolish sales taxes altogether. The point is the carbon tax was supposed to be this elegant, economically sound solution. But as we've seen, putting it into practice is a bit more complicated. We don't even have time to get into the various ways industry and agriculture are treated completely differently than consumers 
or the embarrassing political debacle that was the carbon tax carve-out in Atlantic Canada, pausing the tax for three years on inefficient home heating oil. Given how upset many people still feel about the tax, and given the steep emissions cuts we need to achieve after literal generations of inaction, it's worth asking how effective carbon pricing really is. According to the World Bank, there are currently 30 carbon taxes and 31 emissions trading schemes across the globe, covering 22% of global emissions. But despite how widespread they are, there's shockingly little data on how effective they've been. This meta-analysis tried to answer that question and found that, though carbon pricing has dominated many political discussions of climate change, only 37 studies assess the actual effects of the policy on emissions reductions, with the majority of studies suggesting that the aggregate reductions from carbon pricing on emissions are limited, generally between 0% and 2% per year. And while the article's author points out that carbon taxes seem to be more effective than emissions trading schemes like cap and trade, they also point out how contentious carbon pricing can be, leading to this absolutely hilarious paragraph about how Ontario Premier Doug Ford, quote, not only canceled Ontario's cap and trade scheme upon his election, he also required gas stations to post stickers about the cost of the federal carbon price on gas pumps. This was recently found to be unconstitutional. Ironically, if the Ford government hadn't removed the cap and trade system, which we shared with Quebec and California, Ontario wouldn't have the consumer carbon tax we have now. So respect for taxpayers, I guess. Which is to say, yes, carbon pricing works, but according to the international agreements we've signed and the unfeeling math of atmospheric physics, our emissions have to drop a lot faster. So if you've made it this far into this video, you might be thinking, holy shit, this environmentalist who looks like a chubby Frank Zappa is basically saying, ax the tax. And to clarify, no, I'm not. If we simply get rid of the carbon tax and replace it with nothing, that would be, scientifically speaking, absolutely bananas. But if you're wondering, can we make progress without carbon pricing? The answer is yes. Even with our carbon tax, Canada still has the worst climate record in the G7. Meanwhile, the US of Americans, history's largest carbon polluter, is making progress thanks to the Inflation Reduction Act. In it, you will find stronger regulation, economic planning, and open-ended tax credits. Is it sufficient? No, of course not. The bill was brought to you by a literal coal baron. But is it better than nothing? Yes, of course. In researching this video, I couldn't help but feel frustrated. The carbon tax is taking up all of the oxygen when we have a massive opportunity to improve people's lives while tackling climate change. Just to take a tiny example, there are currently grants and interest-free loans available to homeowners to replace gas boilers and oil furnaces with heat pumps. And if you don't know what a heat pump is, it's an exceedingly boring, yet absolutely miraculous technology that can both heat and cool your home for a fraction of the cost, all without giving your kids asthma. We need to be more open-minded about the ways we cut planet warming pollution. And there are ways to do that without the same backlash we've seen with the consumer carbon tax. Talk to any expert and they will tell you big industrial polluters are simply not paying their fair share. We could be charging industrial polluters far more for their pollution and use the extra money to help lower and middle income households get off fossil fuels with bigger incentives for heat pumps, insulation, plug-in hybrids, or electric vehicles. Personally, I think a windfall tax on oil and gas companies in Canada making record profits off of these high gas prices is probably a good place to start. We could also, for example, charge higher registration fees on big ass vehicles like my evil but warm Ford Bronco SUV, which because of their size and design, not only burn way more fuel, they also make pedestrian fatalities 45% more likely. We can also do a lot more to build efficient and affordable housing while making building permits for large inefficient homes like these more expensive. Not to mention helping municipalities add better cycling infrastructure and better public transportation options so car ownership isn't effectively mandatory to access the necessities of life. The point is, thanks to companies like Exxon, who are continuing their long history of torpedoing progress on this issue both here and around the world, we are well beyond the point where a simple carbon tax can incrementally correct a market failure. We have, quite frankly, run out of time. The biggest polluters, whether large industrial firms or wealthy consumers, are where we should be focusing our attention as we expand options for households who can least afford it. Governments are the only institution large enough to handle this level of scale and complexity. So if not a carbon tax, then what? And if we do keep the carbon tax, how do we win people back? And what else can we be doing? 
I wish we could have adult conversations about issues like this, and as silly as this video was, I tried to give you the facts as best I could, blemishes and all. So now that you've watched this video, what do you think of Canada's carbon pricing system? Or carbon pricing in general? How would you get creative in solving both affordability and climate? Let me know in the comments. This video is a bit of an experiment for me, so let me know if this is the kind of content you'd like to see more of. You can also check out the description for some book recommendations and that carbon tax calculator I mentioned. You can also support the Goose for free by hitting all the buttons. It really does help. And a big thank you to our patrons. You can join the flock at patreon.com slash thegoosemedia. And now, here is former Prime Minister Jean Chrétien choking a guy. Chrétien should be unemployed, the protesters screamed. As the Prime Minister continued toward his car, he came face to face with one of the demonstrators. Suddenly, Chrétien took the man by the back of the neck. His other hand was over the protesters' mouth. He pushed him aside.